So what's the number one injury to our patients in physical therapy? So that's what I've always said. Uh, um, we'll look at some data in just a little bit. So yesterday I got an email, just happened to get an email yesterday from HPSO, which is the number one malpractice insurance company uh, in the country that I know of. So I usually just delete and ignore, but for some reason it caught my eye. And actually it was a bunch of data on burns with physical therapy. And it's got a case report that we'll go through. So uh, hopefully it, it kind of registers and it, it hit me hard yesterday. And guess who doesn't touch modalities, <laughs> right? So even with me of never touching them, I, I said, oh, wow, we got to be really careful. So a couple of things I wanted to highlight the incidence of burns actually is decreasing over time. So in 2011, it was 20% of uh, all claims with injuries. Now it's just, uh, just under 17%. So that's nice. We're getting better at burning our patients less frequently. How does it happen? 33% of the time, it's injury during some sort of heat therapy, hot packs, so that's 33% of the time. Um, what are some simple ways we prevent that from happening? Number of layers, easy. Checking every five minutes. Yep. What else? Being aware of the patient sensation, I think, is one of the number one things, and especially as we dive into this later. Absolutely. If they have poor sensation, they can't tell they're getting burned. So, yeah, huge problem with that. Uh, anything else? Checking the temperature on the hydroculator. Those thermostats are easy to break. Um, and yeah, it, it's really easy to have the temperature of that water go crazy without us even knowing it, especially if we're just using the tongs to, to grab the hot packs. How many people just cowboy it and just reach in with their hands? Uh, so yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, it's really easy to burn our patients. That's way one other way, I think one other common way. Oh, jewelry. I didn't even think about that. Oh, God, I would fail this class if I had to take it. Jewelry, another easy way to create a burn for our patients. One other way that I can think of. So the position of the patient, making sure we have the correct number of layers is really important. Yep. I'm thinking uh, how many of us that work in the clinic now, how many people have seen a hot pack break, right? So if that canvas breaks and we get that, that uh, material leaking out, that material is really hot and it's got no barrier to, uh, it can just seep into the patient's skin. And there we go. We get a really hot burn really quick. So, you know, there's a few ways that we already know of to prevent those things. How many times, how many people that work in the clinic now, how many times are you checking the temperature of the water already? Yeah, you check it every day. How about you have a log that you do it? You haven't. I mean, they might, they might be, you don't, you're not working every single day, right? So, so maybe they are, right? But I think it's an easy thing to overlook. All right, 50% of burns happen because of electrotherapy, which is our next topic. We're gonna to be talking about electrotherapy for roughly the next five or so weeks, four to five weeks. So 50% of burns happening because of the next topics that we're gonna to be talking about. Uh, so we'll be looking at a, a ways to prevent that. Absolutely. The education on our patient on indications, contraindications, and expected experience. There are plenty of our patients that think if it's at this number, it must be good. I might as well crank it up higher. Keep going, keep going. When that's not the case for a lot of what we're, we're the modalities that we're using. So um, just quickly, some other things. Use of unapproved, improper, or incorrect equipment. Iontophoresis related injury. We'll look at that later on. That's a pretty interesting one. Uh, failure to monitor patient during treatment. <laughs> yep. 
That would be me. Uh, yeah, only 3.3. Most of the time, I'm not a... Uh, and then 1.6 injury from cold packs or ice massage. So that one happens way less frequently. So that's nice. Average cost of the claim if there's an injury of burn, a burn injury. Severe, the requires surgery, $280,000. Mild requires only local treatment and comfort, $22,000. So... I don't have an extra 280 grand laying around. Um, I don't have an extra 22 grand laying around. I certainly don't want to give it to one of my patients for getting burned on something that I didn't want to do in the first place. So another reason to say, wow, we've really got to make sure we're being cautious with what we're doing and making sure all these safety things that we talk about, making sure we're inspecting the hot packs, making sure we're inspecting the temperature of the water, all of those tedious things that can really prevent us from hurting our patients and then hurting our careers as well. Now, I wanted to look at this case study. Because we played around with TENS last time. This is a TENS-related injury. Let's look and uh, we'll read it and we'll see what, what aspects we missed and which ones that we look at and say like, oh, I probably would have missed that too. So male patient, early 30s, prescribed physical therapy after undergoing an arterial bypass procedure in his right leg for popliteal artery entrapment. Oh, geez, that's pretty weird. On evaluation, patient had a complex medical history, included morbid obesity, diabetes, chronic leg pain. Socialist revealed sedentary occupation, smoked a pack of cigarettes per day, occasionally used alcohol. Due to patient's size, post-surgical pain and numbness, had difficulty weight bearing on his right leg, used crutches to ambulate. Several different pain medications, including hydromorphone, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, and pregabalin. Patient surgeon prescribed physical therapy for three months for pain management to, to strengthen his lower extremities and to assist with mobility. Patient had three sessions of PT, insured PT, used TENS on the patient's right leg for 10 to 15 minutes at the end of each session. Those that are working in the clinics, that sound common. Little pain relief, whether it's TENS or a different form, an electrical current used for pain relief. Yeah. All right. Um, <clears throat> However, the physical therapist failed to complete sensory testing before the, placing the TENS on the patient. Pace, uh, PT adjusted the intensity on the patient's comfort level, asked the patient to let them know if the TENS caused discomfort. The patient seemed to enjoy the nerve stimulation, reporting that the TENS unit was the only thing to really seem to bring back the feeling in his leg and reduce the pain in his leg. So, Man, I, he's on a bunch of pain meds. If this is the only thing that works, man, I'm feeling pretty good about myself. If that's me, I'm glad we found something for you. This is awesome. All right, on the day of the incident, we just completed a 12-minute session with the TENS unit. The PT took the pads off the right leg. She noticed two round marks that appeared to be burns. Neither the patient or the PT believed the burns were severe enough for a hospital visit while it was not within the pt scope of practice to diagnose the burn or provide treatment pt applied antibiotic ointment to the burns and advised the patient to follow with the metal practitioner as on a as needed basis pt checked the tens unit would appear to be in good working order only possible source for the burns appeared to be the pads which looked a little worn following day the patient called the pt to let her know they need to go to the doctor because the burns were looking worse during the follow-up phone call, the patient informed the insured PT that had been diagnosed with a third-degree burns that would need debridement and skin grafts, and the burns were serious. The patient continued PT as much as possible, but it was complicated due to the treatment of the burn and subsequent pain. So now we're the additional pain of all of these burns and debridements and grafts. Two months after the incident, the patient was diagnosed with RSD. Also reported experiencing temperature and tolerance, excessive sweating, stress, and insomnia due to pain. RSD symptoms also prevented him from working. As a result, his family lost their health insurance benefits and suffered potential bankruptcy. So 
there's uh, the resolution here. It was defense counsel's opinion that the PTs lack training of how to appropriately use TENS unit and the PTs failure to ensure that the TENS unit pads were working properly in order uh, before applying to the patient, making the difficult the claim difficult to defend. So possibly the defense verdict seemed to be less than 20%. Defense counsel assessed the potential claim to be between seven hundred fifty thousand and one million dollars, and they ended up settling for seven hundred fifty thousand dollars. So, what ways did this PT go wrong? How many steps along the way? Talk about precautions and indications. And what's the number one precaution that this page, this particular patient had? Ultra sensation. And if we look at the, when we get into some of our lecture material today, obesity is one thing with electrical stimulation that is really tough. Um, it's a poor conductor of electric. So you need more intensity to create a similar effect. So. Um, we'll look at that later, but yeah, so that's a risk factor. Already had a, a popliteal artery entrapment, uh, arterial bypass graft, so we know circulation is poor. And we know with his smoking a pack of cigarettes a day, his healing potential, even though he's in his early 30s, his healing potential, what do you think? Poor, 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 poor. Poor blood supply. He already had a bypass graft. Uh, history of smoking. That's going to de destroy the microvascular system. If this guy gets a wound, we are at risk for amputation. So I, that's a huge problem for this guy. Lots of pain. Seems like we're kind of... What other options do we have, do you think, for pain relief? Ice and heat, potentially. Oh, yeah, I think all of our pain modulation is psychological. I don't know if we do a ton at the cellular level to fix anything, you know, but. Sure, always. I, I would agree with them. Yeah, I'm not sure that we have to. I'm not sure. Well, if, if, if they're writing off electricals, all forms of electricals, Tim, I think, yeah, I, I, I think we might have uh, been a little bit too, too uh, aggressive in that in the first place. But yeah. Hot and cold therapies, potentially different massages with RSD. Now we've got a lot of other sensations that we've got. To, it, that's it's a long, long road to getting back. Now we've got a we've got a whole lot of things that we can try to do, and our success rate is going to be pretty low. This guy's paddling upstream, that's for sure. Um, so, what mistakes along the way? What other, so the, I think the checking the skin, the sensation is the number one thing. So there's some things we do here and because we do it every single day, or at least we say we do it every day, like, you know, skin screen plus sensation is important. I think because we do it so often, we kind of just like, it just becomes automatic and we don't actually think about it. Does that make sense? Does that feel like it might be true for us? Where you say like, oh, it just feel good. Okay, let's just keep going. When, well, no, no, we've got to really make sure that the patient can have, that has an adequate uh, feeling of it. Now, what, uh, anything else? One other big thing, yeah. Yeah, that's the weird thing about electrical burns, though, is that it can it can look 
on a superficial level, not that bad, but oh, then okay. then subcutaneously. Yeah. Yeah, I think it is. And the reason why I know that, like, I, I hear what you're saying, like, it doesn't look that bad. And then what the heck happened? I think patients can amplify their pain sensations. And I know I've had patients, and if there's a lawyer involved with the case, I, I don't want to completely discount what are the patients saying, but I do think there's an amplification that my lawyers told me I should never improve. So I'm going to tell you that I'm always at an eight out of 10 pain. Um, so I think that does happen, but this guy needed debridement and surgery. Do you think that, yeah. do you think the surgeon is going in saying like, nah, let me just cut you open. Yeah. Like, no, no, like, I, nobody wants to touch this guy because we're in trouble here. Like this guy, th there's no good outcome this guy is going to have. Um, so I, I, no, I don't think there's an amplification of this. I think there's, yeah, third degree burns. Absolutely. Yep. Um, what other things did the PT miss? So the post-op treat, the post-injury treatment outside of the scope of practice, you're not, your job's not to diagnose the severity of burns. We should have sought treatment right away and applying medication to say like, ah, oh, this is fine. Like, yeah, if we wanted to call your mom and say, Hey mom, what do we do? Then mom and dad can take care of that, but that's not our scope of practice. Yep. Yep. Checking the pads is the next big thing. Uh, and, and one thing that we talked about today is how do we take our uh, last time is how do we take care of our pads when we're removing the pads make sure that we're pulling it from the corners and not from the electrical wiring itself that'll help maintain the integrity of the pads but making sure we're inspecting the pads along the way just like we inspect um, the temperature water of the hydroculator water we're checking the integrity of our therabands and theratubes making sure there's no nicks when the patient stretches it all the way out that's going to blast them Coming back the same way so um yeah i think that's that's a big step that we missed did anybody have anything else to yeah yeah absolutely so now yeah so we've got poor sensation anyway and then we're hopped up on a whole bunch of different pain meds. Is that limiting his sensation even more so? And especially when we're talking about the noxious stimulus. Yeah, potentially. Yeah. Yeah. And I wonder, it seems like we had three visits successfully with no problems. And then I wonder, maybe he, maybe the, the visit in question, maybe it was an afternoon session instead of a morning session where the timing of the medication could have played a bigger factor into it than it did the previous three, potentially. Yeah. Yeah. Like, was he feeling nothing at all? Like, could he have felt something? Kind of felt something during the initial like sensation test and, and like okay well I do feel something yeah like, yeah oh, that's fine yeah I feel that yeah and I fly it and it's just too much for that yeah I I think what you got you got a great point you know maybe they would pass a a broad sensation screen but once we apply the electrical modality like it's still not he still has impaired enough sensation that he passed our screening, but here's what the lawyer would say. You know what the lawyers say? You didn't do it. So it doesn't happen matter. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Maybe he wouldn't swear at you. Uh, so yeah, I think, but even if we did the in sensation screen, we are allowed to make mis we are allowed to have bad things happen to our patients. We are not allowed to have bad things happen to our patients and we miss every single step along the way. So this therapist missed this uh, sensation screen and they also missed the checking of the pads. If we did those two things and the patient still had the electrical burn, guess what would happen? We'd hug the guy and say, I'm really sorry this happened to you. Nothing here, you know, but because of those two things, the defense counsel and, and the great thing, of these insurance companies don't care about you, they just care about their money. Like they're not going to defend your liability claim if they, they think you're going to lose. They're just going to, they're after their own pockets. So um, they said, we're not going to win this. 80% chance says we're going to fail. Cut them a check now. 
because it's going to be they they said it's going to be between 750 and a million dollars cut them a check today and we potentially save ourselves 250 grand that's all they their decision making was but man as long as we did this the sensation screen and then we documented it and we educated the patient with informed consent on risks and benefits the yeah patients along the way making those decisions absolutely um but i think we missed those steps now here's the thing when i'm reading this case I probably would have used sense too. You know, I, I think I would have done a sensory screen and maybe the patient would have passed it, but man, I would have had that layer of saying, no, no, I did that. I did everything right. And we still had an injury. Yeah. Sometimes crazy things happen. Yeah. Yeah. If you didn't write it down, you didn't do it. So why our documentation is really important is because if we, if we just wrote, you know, tens at the end for 12 minutes, if we didn't educate, if we didn't uh, document that we inspected skin and, and performed skin screen, educated patient on indications, kind of indications, then yeah, we, we just didn't do it. Um, so another thing for you guys. PT doesn't do so in this case, it also says there are other defendants in this case, the practice owner was one of them. It also said non licensed personnel, who do you think that is rehab aids. So they were also defendants in the case, although they had no liability for it. Uh, the owners of the company had a little liability because there are some things. When it said here, it said uh, lack of training. Well, the PTs were taught in school exactly where you guys are today, how to use this stuff, but they didn't have any formal in-house education and, and skill competency so that that was something that legally in risk management, if you ever want to own your business, that's something we should be doing as well. And actually, when you guys are on your clinicals and on your, when you first get hired, you're going to have to do a bunch of things that... You say, I have to learn this in school. They say, yeah, I know we got to sign the form though. And you're just going to have to do it. Every single year, I have to watch my my staff on so they know how to wash their hands, put on gloves, you know, take blood pressure. Every single year, we have to do it. Got some of the best clinicians you could ever find. And I have to watch them wash their hands every single year. Yeah, we signed the form. We did it. Okay, good. Let's move on. Go fix the world now, you know, so... We do, yeah, yep. So anyway, I, looking at this, I think I'm gonna refer back to this case a couple of times, I think today, and, and maybe throughout the, our electrical time on ways we could improve this. Um, so, yeah. Is that for tens or? Uh, I don't know. Let's see. Yeah, but I still have another thing I just thought. Like, yep. So patient, if you already know they have some black patient issues or some patient issues, what is IFC trying to be better than them because them also controlling the tent unit, they're going to make it way too high versus you have control of the IFC. Um, so the question of does it matter if the patient has control of it or if we have control of it in this case I don't think it matters because we didn't do a skin screen so it doesn't matter if we educated the patient on how to adjust the intensity or we have to keep it this way we didn't do the steps going into it we didn't check the pads we didn't uh, do the skin screen so I don't think it matters um, but it, uh, when we look at tens in a little bit, some of the things we have to educate our patient on, yeah, that's in there. That's part of the education process that we have to give our patients. All right. So So broadly speaking, electrotherapy indications, contraindications, precautions. So we're going to use electrotherapy. This week, we're going to talk mostly about pain. But there's other settings we can use for muscle strengthening that we saw. We also uh, reduce muscle spasm, wound care, edema management, maybe to increase range of motion, delivery of medications we'll look at later, 
Contraindications, pregnancy, depending on the source that we look at, we'll have pregnancy. First trimester is definitely something that we have to be ultra cautious with. The other thing is, how long does pregnancy last? Nine months, so yeah. A couple of people are like, nine months. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's one of those things where you look at the person and we, we part of the decision making is, can we just wait a few more months before we do anything? Like um, the first trimester, have I talked about why the first trimester is such a cautious time? Roughly 20% of all pregnancies are miscarried in the first trimester. Once you're beyond the first trimester, how can we wait until, you know, three months until that we start telling people is because that's when the risk of spontaneous miscarriage plummets. Um, so, yeah, the first trimester, I'm not doing anything. Even if there's no, there's no uh, research that says like, oh, this modality or this technique can has a risk of causing miscarriage. What you don't want to happen is you don't want to have the patient come to you, you do any sort of modality, and then they go home and four hours later have a miscarriage. Just having those two things next to each other, it doesn't have to be a cause and effect. It doesn't matter. So yeah, I would basically do as little as possible in that first trimester. After the, in the second trimester, I get to be a little more aggressive, get my options are a little bit more open. Um, but there's still that decision-making process of, oh, can we just wait a few more months? Is this really that big of a deal? So uh, something for us to think about. Cardiac pacemaker, definitely. I think that makes the most sense. We have a cardiac pacemaker. We have an electrical implant, making sure our heart beats. I don't really want to mess around with adding more electrical card to that person. Let's have their heart continue beating and we'll move on. Different cardiac arrhythmias, cardiac disease, thrombophlebitis, acute tuberculosis. You guys listen to the respiratory. Oh, no. Oh, you have listened to the respiratory run, isn't that on the exam today? So uh, good acute tuberculosis. Tuberculosis, I think, is a fascinating condition. Uh, it could just stay there for years on end, just calcify. Oh, we took an x ray of your lungs and we saw you have tuberculosis. It might come up in a few years. I just think that's fascinating. Anyway. Not over the carotid sinuses, any active hemorrhage. Precautions, obesity, we'll look at why later. Absent or diminished sensation is a precaution, not into contraindication. So in that case we just looked at, you know, I don't think we, I don't think they missed any obvious contraindications and especially chronic pain, nothing else is working. I think some of our, our modalities could really help this person. So it's a precaution. Different skin diseases, thin, fragile skin, superficial metal, weight bearing restrictions as a precaution. That's what you had. That's what I was asking about. I wasn't sure if that was weight as well. I believe so because we wouldn't want muscle contraction. So there's some different settings and different locations we might be able to put on. Uh, I think that's the the big thing. We don't want to be breaking. If we're causing a muscle contraction and that muscle contraction is either breaking range of motion um, precautions or it's activating the muscles and creating compression, that would basically be breaking weight-bearing restrictions. So I think we have to be cautious that we're not breaking those things. That's why. Uh, disorientation, spinal cord injury, or other precautions. So documentation. They did the skin check, really important. Educated the patient on indications, contraindications, precautions. Uh, patient position sometimes can be important. Electrode placement and configuration, electrode size. We talked about the different size electrodes last time. What, in general, what do we want? If we we're gonna select, the bigger the elect, the biggest the electrode that'll fit. Most of the time, have you guys in your clinics ever seen anything other than the two by two squares, the little the squares that we use? No, the little dots, the little circle ones we've seen. Anything else? Four inch circular ones. What do you? What have you seen those for? Oh, cool. Nice. Well, that's great. Uh, what the type of stimulation is, parameters, time, potentially a response, especially if there's an abnormal response, we'd want to put it there. Yeah. Uh, 
Yes, yes. I don't have I so great question. I'm gonna see this person for three months. I'm gonna see him twice a week or three months. Do I really have to document that I educate on indication, contraindication every single time? No, you do not. Uh, informed consent and education on the modality should happen on the first time. The skin check should be every single time because skins can change, right? If they fall down and and you know get a little road rash on their hip and we're going to go apply a modality to it no we've got skin can change quickly over time the indications kind of indication precautions aren't going to unless unless they have a new diagnosis that would potentially fall into one of those categories um so no we don't have to but In the case that we just saw, the PT dropped the ball on the initial evaluation, not doing skin checks, probably not educating the patient thoroughly on this stuff. If you're the next therapist, do you want to rely on that previous PT to make sure they did their job? Yep. So I think that you guys should always, the first time you work with your patient, you should act as if the previous PT or PTA didn't do their job. That's the only way to protect yourself. And I mean, I work really hard. I still make mistakes. And especially if the guy shows up 25 minutes late, my next patient shows up 10 minutes early. And I've also got a phone call or a return phone call from the doc that I've been trying to get a hold of for three weeks about something like it's easy for me to just make a mistake and, and just be rushed and drop the ball on something like that. Um, especially as something that feels so routine as placing electrodes on somebody. It's, it's, it's just, so it feels, we do it a thousand times. AIDS, the people who are texting AIDS here, how many times a day do you do it in a shift? All the time, right? It feels like nothing. So it's so easy for me to drop the ball on, on that guy. It's so easy. Um, I think the best thing you can do is protect yourself where at least the first time you work with somebody, you do the job. And how many times in patho actually have we talked about patient education and where the patient didn't know something that we, you know, my patient with uh, my student who had MS, she had MS for years before I ever met her and she didn't know temperature affected would increase her symptoms. She never made them. I have to tell you that I, 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 I'm shocked that you didn't know that. Right. So we always should be protecting ourselves and making sure our, our patients well-informed, well-screened. If we do everything right and they still get hurt, we did everything right. We tried to minimize the risks, um, but that's why I wouldn't leave it in. So in your scenario, PT put the electrotherapy in the plan of care. Yeah, we should probably keep doing it, but you need to do your screen. And if you feel like, hey, this person, obesity, pain out the wazoo, I'm not sure what meds they're on today, you know, or not. I don't know. I, I can't get a handle on what this guy is actually feeling or not. Poor healing potential if an injury does happen. That's a great conversation for you to have with the PT and say, hey, I know you put East Tim on this thing, uh, for, on the plan of care for this guy. I'm concerned with these factors. What else can we do? And one thing we'll look at when we get into TENS later today is we're going to look at other things we could still use TENS for and potentially decrease the risk of injury. We'll look at some of that later. But yeah, that's you're the professional too. Just because the PT wrote on a piece of paper, who's smarter? You were a piece of paper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it doesn't matter who wrote on the piece of paper. You're still the clinician. You're still the professional. You, yeah, you have to do your job. And actually, for me, I would love it if one of the PTAs that I work with would call me up and say, "Hey, Josh, I know you put this. I think you really missed something here." I think that's wonderful because it means you're really thinking and I trust you. I trust you so much now because you are, you got my back. Hey, you, did you do this? No, my God, I was, I can't believe I forgot to do that. Right. So yeah, you would be my best friend if you were to help me 
cover my back like that. Absolutely. So I wouldn't consider, are you worried that it would be like a conflict that you're, no, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, this guy, yeah, this guy was, I, I see myself as this therapist. Yep. Um, maybe making the mistake, it's easy to make that mistake because, again, it feels so routine. The guy was getting benefit from it. It happened three times successfully without any other problem. I, I see myself being that therapist. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I think you really long answer to make sure that you guys should always do your job doesn't matter if somebody else saw the patient beforehand doesn't matter if you really like that person you should always do your job because we could easily say yes the pt didn't do the skin screen on initial eval neither did the pta when they saw the person and now you're in the case too and not just the pt yeah yep Yeah. Yeah. yeah a hundred percent yeah and I, you know I, I don't like to cover my rear end just for the sake of doing it although when we look at these cases well it's also this patient's life went from bad to worse and while i, I am proud of my career and what I'm doing and, and it's a part of me and, and a part of my identity. I'm going to have the toughest time sleeping at night thinking of this guy. He went from bad to worse. He came to me and I was, I at one point I was his hope to have a better life and his life is way worse now. So that's the part that I would really have a trouble with. Uh, so we saw some different types of e-SIMs today. We're going to focus on e-SIM for pain relief, TENS, IFC. We'll look at pre-mod too, pre-mods like the JV, IFC. So we talked about the different ways, the different elements that we need to get electrical simulation from you know, the electricity into the patient. So we need an energy source, a pathway that conducts electrical current, electrode interface that touches the skin and a complete circuit. The electrodes, uh, pads is what we oftentimes call them. That's the instrument for electrical current delivery. We have the lead wires. The lead wires have two ends to it, the jack that plugs into the simulator and then the pins that plug into the electrode. The electrodes, we use self-adhering, reusable electrodes. The patient interface of that might have high impedance or resistance. So the more resistance, the more electrical current we're going to need to deliver to the patient. We'll look at Ohm's law in just a minute to hopefully improve upon that. There's different metal plate electrodes, carbon fiber impregnated uh, rubber electrodes too. Those are, I, I've never seen those clinically. I've only seen the reusable electrodes. Have you guys who are techs seen any other types of electrodes other than similar to what we used? So the larger the electrodes, the better. The larger the electrode, the less the resistance of the, the person. So the resistance is the person's skin is not accepting the electrical charge. So the 
larger the electrodes, they have lower resistance than smaller electrodes. There might be advantages to using mismatched sizes. When I was looking through my material last night, I couldn't find a reason what that is, a justification, but put that in somewhere in deep in your brain where you'd say like, if you ever stuck with a person, maybe that you could um, use that at some point. I think there's one picture we have mismatched size electrodes. We can think about that, why that was. Uh, so the bigger the pad size, the lower the resistance of the electricity into the body. The analogy the textbook has is, would you rather enter your house through the window or through the door? Door, it's easier, right? Let's just go through the door. It's bigger. It fits me. My window is smaller. I've got to climb up. It. I, I, yeah, let's just go through the door. So, all right, makes sense. One other thing that we can start looking at, especially as our pads are wearing, did you guys feel like your pads started wearing out? The adhesion of the pads started wearing out even within one trial, yes, last time. So when that happens, as long as they're not cracked or damaged in any way, just the adhesive is wearing off, we can clean our pads. That will help. We can also, they don't have to be have adhesive on it. Like the carbon fiber and impregnated uh, electrodes don't have adhesive to it. We just have to have straps holding them into place. So we can do that. A little bit more time consuming, but the more contact of the pads with the patient's skin, the better the electrical current delivery, which is going to help us and it's also going to improve our safety. Especially as, and I'm sure our aides and our techs will tell you, um, especially as they try to contour to different parts of the body, when they start losing their adhesion, the corners start like pulling up. No, it's still on. Well, if we actually sock it down with the strap, that's going to be much better. A couple of different terms, electrical muscle stimulation. I've never seen this ESTR, electrical stimulation for tissue repair, although I've never used electrical stimulation clinically for tissue repair. So maybe it is more common than what I see. Neuromuscular electrical stimulation, I have seen NMES. FES, functional electrical stimulation. This, these are pretty cool. They, that's where the AFO has electrodes embedded within it. And once the it senses that the foot is off of the ground, it'll fire the it'll, it'll deliver the electrical charge to cause the anterior tip to fire. So those are pretty cool. Did we see the video of uh, that woman with her exoskeleton? That's similar. The what? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Oh, that's right. That's the way we did it. Uh, tense transcutaneous electrical stimulation. So we're going to be using a handful of different terms that we'll have to learn and we'll try to keep using them. So I think one of the problems, not problems, but one of the tough things about our all medic medical education is we learn a new term and then try to apply it right away when we're just kind of learning the language. So it'd be like sitting in French class and being like, okay, uh, je m'appelle Josh. Okay, je m'appelle Josh, I got it. And they say, okay, great. I'm going to put this word problem in French and you have to solve it. You go, wait, 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 <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Um, so I think that's really tough. We have to you know, learn the terms and then we apply it right away. And then you go, wait a minute, what's the term? So we're going to go through some of that. You can write them down, highlight them, whatever it makes sense to you. Did you have something you wanted to ask? Okay. So the strength of what we're using uh, also is charge. The rate of flow is current. The driving force voltage and the opposition is resistance or impedance. The number one thing we're going to want to troubleshoot is reducing the impedance. I think in the case there, in the, the troublesome case that we saw, I think there's some things that the therapist also missed in reducing the impedance that probably would have made things a little bit safer. And that's also going to be something where, where somebody says, I just don't feel it. You guys have the text here. You guys ever have a patient that just goes, 
I'm not feeling this. And you crank it all the way up and you're wondering like, gosh, this guy just doesn't feel anything. There's ways we can reduce the impedance. They have a high impedance. There's a few ways we can do that. So we're going to troubleshoot some ways for that. So I will say in this unit of electrical stim, I don't care what we're using the stim for, pain, wound healing, uh, tissue repair, strengthening. The troubleshooting is the big thing that I, we need to accomplish. The, the fix shouldn't just be turn the machine up higher. There should be a, a few other things that we look at. So here's some terminology from what electricity is. And I think we all use water. So I think uh, this is nice for us. I also, you guys remember in when we're looking at diathermy, laser, and ultrasound, where I'm sit, standing up here and I'm saying like, man, we could dive into the the physics of the machine. We could also dive into the physiology of the person. We could spend hours upon hours learning it all. And then the end of it, we'd say, we'll just press that button. Right? So I think all of that back knowledge can be important. But I think some of it's just going to be a lot of wasted time. So we're going to talk about some of these things. I think if we were to go into, you know, the talked about a, a, to a, an electrician they'd, they'd be able to get some of this stuff right off the bat and they'd say uh you need you need to know more than that so just understand that we're going to scratch the surface if you have questions please ask i want to stay away from learning how to wire a house and just kind of look at how does it work with the patient so the electron, the analogy to water would be a water drop column, a gallon of water. So those are units that we would be able to talk about. The current would be the water flow. So when we talk about the, the um, current is just, are we delivering electricity to the person? Voltage, how much water pressure? If we had low voltage, anybody ever have a old house where the water pressure just is terrible? It just drips out. Maybe a hotel, you go to an old hotel and you go like, this is it, right? So that would be low voltage. High voltage would be something like a water pick, maybe a pulsatile lavage. Or if you want, we can spend some time watching super soaker videos. Do you guys want to look at that one again? Um, so high voltage. Resistance is the impedance. So in the water pipe, if we had a narrow pipe or a clogged drain, then that would limit, that would be the resistance. So the more resistance, the less flow we have through, right? So that is because of Ohm's law. The relationship between current voltage and resistance is defined by Ohm's law. Current is directly proportional to voltage and inversely proportional to resistance. So what that means is I want current into my patient, right? That's the water flow. In order to get water flow, I need some sort of voltage. I need some sort of pressure, right? But if I have a lot of resistance, I'm not going to get a lot of flow. Does that make sense to everybody, right? So I, if we have what this picture is trying to show us is if I've got medium voltage, medium resistance, I'm going to get medium current into my patient. If I have high voltage and medium resistance, I'm going to get a little bit more current to it. Great. Although if I have medium voltage and high resistance, I'm going to get impaired current into my patient. So, so much of what we're going to troubleshoot is how do we reduce the resistance? How do we reduce the impedance of the person? There's a few ways we're going to be looking at that. Uh, we've already talked about one of them, electrode size. Another thing that we started playing around with last time was electrode location. Where exactly am I putting these electrodes on? We'll look at, we talked about cleaning the skin too. That's one way we can reduce impedance. Uh, removing body hair. That's another way we can reduce impedance. So we'll talk about some of these things as we move on.
current will follow the path of least resistance and the impedance, the resistance varies throughout the body. High water, it's uh, highly dependent on water content. High water content decreases the impedance and improves conductance. So things like muscle have high water content. Adipose tissue comparing comparatively has lower water content. So an area with a lot of adipose tissue is going to resist or have a high impedance to electrical current. One of the reasons why that guy probably got an electrical burn is because one, the ultra sensation, two, we know he was morbidly obese. Because he's morbidly obese, he's gonna, we go back to our Ohm's law. He has high resistance. Patient says, I just don't feel it. Keep turning it up. We jack up the voltage to try to get the current there, but the voltage is so high, now we're at risk for creating a burn, especially when the pads are, the electrodes are faulty. So um, that was another big factor for that guy. So some different ways to minimize the impedance, really important for us all, clean the skin first, removing all body oils, lotions, things like that, removing excess body hair, warming the region to be stimulated first can also help, especially when the patient is just has high impedance, we can warm the tissue first and then apply our electrodes. I know a lot of times clinically we do it concurrently. Electrodes, here's your heat. Okay, great. Everything. You just feel great for a little bit. Now I get up and let's try to move or just stay there and just bill you. Uh, I would go along with that. Yeah. Uh, ice would have the opposite effect. Yeah. And especially if water, the more water content, the e the less impedance. Well, by using heat, we're bringing in more blood flow. We're bringing in more moisture. We're bringing in more salt content. Where if we cause a vasoconstriction with icing, then the opposite is happening. So yeah, I, I think that would be a good thought. So current's gonna flow if there's a source of energy creating the difference in electrical potential and there's a pathway between the two potentials. Uh, one thing that we will look at more later when we start doing ionophoresis, it's important for us to understand that the ionic flow occurs in the underlying tissues like charges repel, unlike or opposites attract. So if I have a negative electrode on my patient's skin, Anything negative, anything charged negatively underneath that patient's skin is going to be repelled away. Anybody ever play with magnets? Kim's not here to say no. So everybody else here, <laughs> um, you know, the two ends of the magnet, if you get two negatives, they're just not going to touch. So you're going to get really close and then they're going to push each other away. So uh, that's what that means. Higher risk for ion burns when there's a buildup of negative ions underneath the skin. Uh, especially with direct current. So something for us to think about later on. Positive ions known as cations, negative ions and anions. So we have different settings on the machines. I got to play around with the Chattanoogas because I think they have it uh, where we have a constant current stimulator versus a constant voltage stimulator. So the car constant current stimulator would produce current that uh, does not vary independent of any change in resistance throughout the treatment. So you guys know if you, maybe you guys felt it when you were, actually we felt this with, combo ultrasound 
know, with combo ultrasound, you're you're moving the electric the sound head around, and you say like, "Wow, I feel it a lot right there, and less so right there." If magically we were to be able to create a constant current stimulator with that ultrasound head, the machine itself would modulate its its voltage, or I'm sorry, its current to always be level. So never feel like a big spot and then a little spot. Uh, and then for when we're applying it with electrodes, you guys know when you just shift a little bit or, you know, maybe the hot pack slides a little bit, if we're changing the amount of contact with the pad, that's going to change the sensation a lot too. So the constant current stimulator, is just like cruise control in the car. It's going to keep every, it's going to keep you at this speed. It's going to keep you at this. And we're just going to modulate from that. Okay. The constant voltage uh, doesn't, the voltage doesn't vary. The current can increase or decrease depending on all of those factors that we were talking about. Um, some other terminologies we're going to have to know monopolar use of a single electrode. We'll use that uh, iontophoresis, I believe. It's been a while, so I might be wrong on that. Uh, bipolar, which we use with our tens. Quadpolar, we use with our IFC. So we're going to look at a couple other terms that will play into more and more importance later. And again, this is one of those things that I'm going to briefly touch on so you're aware of it. I'm not going to go dive into it because I don't think it's going to help our education extensively. So the different currents we can have, direct current, if we looked at this diagram over here, that's either the current is always positive or always negative. That's our direct current. Alternating current is going to have moments of positive and then moments of of negative current. So that's going to be really good because that's going to reduce that buildup of ions underneath the skin. We can have pulsed currents. They can either be, there's a whole bunch of things they could do. They could also be, if we were to describe the shape of the current, we could have sawtooth, trapezoid, triangular, rectangular or squared, spike, sinus, so those are all different ones. Again, I don't think any of this really matters for us. We could also have AC-DC current. So anytime we can bring up AC-DC, we should. <laughs> Welcome back, Michelle. I... <laughs> all right. All right, you know what? Uh, let's do this. Let's take a quick break, fill up your waters. We'll try to come back. We'll look at some of the other current stuff and then uh, we'll play around with some stuff soon enough, okay? All right, so while you guys have your heat on you, I wanna talk about just briefly the different types of currents. Because if you look in your textbook, other textbook research, you are going to see some of these terms. Again, I, I the difference, the big ones I want to make sure we understand are alternating currents versus direct current. Because direct current is more dangerous because it's going to build up the ions underneath of the skin because it's only got the one, it's only either positive or negative. Alternating currents are much safer because they reduce that risk. So a continuous current, alternating, I'm sorry, direct current, continuous uh, unidirectional flow of charge, particles at least one second. One electrode is always the anode, the positive, and the other is the cathode, the negative. So there's a net charge or accumulation of charge resulting in the chemical effect in the underlying tissues. So if I have my positive electrode, what ions are gonna be building up underneath of it in the skin? The negative, right? So that is good, Sometimes and other times it's something we just have to be extra cautious with. When we do iontophoresis and high volt galvanic for tissue repair, those are two that we use direct current for that we're just going to have to have that extra layer of safety and education with our patients about.
Alternating current has uh, bidirectional flow of charged particles at least once per second. May be interrupted as form of burst. We'll look at that in a little bit. Each electrode becomes positive from one phase and then negative. So underneath of your pads, when you're when you have your tens on, they are positive then negative, positive then negative, positive then negative constantly. So there's no charge buildup of of tissues, uh, buildup of charge underneath the tissue. So tens, international current, Russian, we'll all be that. And here's our ACDC there for you too. ACDC, anytime I want to rock out. Direct current. Yep. So the direct current, I would use the two ways that we're going to talk about it in this class is with ion terapresis, that's to deliver medication into the patient's skin. So what we do with that is we actually have an electrode with a, like a gauze in the middle of it. We soak that gauze with the medication that we want to deliver. The medication is either going to be charged positively or negatively. So we slap that on the patient and we, if the medication is positive, which electrode do we want to be we want positive because then it's going to repel the medication away from the charge. It's going to drive it into the patient's skin. Yeah. So that's one example in when we would use the direct current. The other one is with uh, high volt galvanic. And the easiest way to think of that, when we start talking about wounds, we'll, wounds gets a really weird really fast when we use our electricity for it. The easiest one is with, edema so swelling has a net charge a negative net charge so if we've got a whole bunch of swelling in my ankle and we've got to drive it away which type of electrode would we want to put over the we want negative electrode over my negatively charged swelling and if i put the positively charged electrode more proximal that's going to attract the swelling away uh, more proximally, and then the negative is going to drive it away. So that's where we'd use the direct current. So those two examples most often. So again, this is one of those things that we could either dive into and learn a whole bunch about for weeks on end, or we can just briefly mention it and you can have it a working idea of okay these things exist and if you're really interested in electrophysiology uh, it is a pretty fascinating thing to think about if you like physics and then then go right ahead i don't think learning this stuff is going to really improve our education as as we apply it to our patients obviously the more education we have the better but uh, I think it would end up being a lot of wasted time. I think you guys would look back and say like, yeah, we talked about that stuff a lot and nobody's ever asked me, is that a sawtooth diagram or is that a trap? Like, yeah, I just don't think it would come up. Um, we could have monophasic, biphasic, polyphasic. We could have uh, symmetrical, balanced, asymmetrical, unbalanced, asymmetrical. So th there's a whole bunch that we could describe it as. So the one thing that we will look at are bursts. So bursts is having multiple cycles, three or more phases. We're going to play around with some different both, uh, burst settings. I th actually think later today. So on some of the things that we need to look at, amplitude is going to be our intensity, either measured in milliamps, microamps, voltage, or current. Frequency is how many. So hertz, I think, is what our TENS units has. Although when I describe uh, hertz is times per second. Uh, the I think when I pull up the parameters, it's measured, it, I, I have it noted as pulses per second. So those are the same thing, right? Hertz and pulses per second is the same thing. 
uh, looking at rate cycles per second. So those are all different frequency terms. Pulse duration is how long is this going to stay on for? So our pulse duration was either above or below 200 microseconds, I think, in the two forms of tens that we had. So when it turns on, how often, how long does it stay on for? So the, the, the frequency is how often is it turning on per second? And then the duration is how long does it stay on for when it is on? Uh, that's the duration. And it's also I, pulse duration and pulse width we use interchangeably. So I'm sure when, when I'm talking, I'm going to say pulse width or pulse duration. And same thing for our textbooks and our, our other material that we look at. So the, that's because when we draw out our pulses, when we draw it out on our time versus intensity graph, this has a shorter duration. It also drawn out as a shorter width than this one. So that's why we use width as a description of time. That's a weird thing. Um, but when we draw it out, it does make a little bit more sense. No, no, it's okay. There are also times when we look at our muscle strengthening type e stims. There can be a a ramp up time and a ramp down time. We play with that briefly a little bit, where it, it's going to ramp up for two seconds, then stay on, and then it's going to either shut off immediately, or do we want it to be gradual? So those are some characteristics that we could talk about. Interpulse interval, basically how long is the off time for? So here is probably the, the most important kind of con concept of, of our e-sims to look at. Looking at, again, time, duration of our pulse versus amplitude, the intensity of it. The lower the intensity and the shorter the duration, we're going to elicit more of a sensory effect. If we want a motor effect, we need a stronger intensity, but we also need longer duration. And actually, if we look at our TENS unit, we, we did TENS for sensory versus TENS for uh, motor, right? We do uh, when the endogenous opiate, uh, opiate liberation, the pulse duration was longer than the, for the sensory. So that's what that is. If we have an even longer duration with even more intensity, we're going to start eliciting pain. And I think we've all probably felt that when we've either turned that dial up too fast, or you just say, oh, let me see what that feels like. Oh, no, we'll go back down, right? So um, I have a hard time thinking when we'd want to induce pain to our patients. I mean, maybe like... I'm sick of you showing up late, then maybe that would be the kind, but, um, but yeah, so that's why we always, part of our conversation is it should not hurt. That's part of this conversation for all of our e-sims that we do. This should not hurt. Holsterations, frequency. So with the frequency and when we looked at IFC versus TENS, impedance will decrease as frequency increases. That's why IFC was so much more comfortable than TENS because we have a really high frequency. It, the, the impedance, the resistance of that is a lot less. And that's one of the benefits of IFC. So modulation is the ability of the electrical simulation to vary one or more of the electrical parameters. It prevents adaptation to the current. So that is one thing that will always happen to our patients and our rehab aides will tell you right now. 
there are plenty of patients that say, oh, I don't feel it anymore, right? So the, the, the body just gets used to the sensation. Um, so adding modulation, either our sweep settings for something like our IFC, um, that can help decrease the amount of accommodation that the patient feels. Now, care of the electrodes, clean it all the time. Make sure we don't leave any residue as after we clean it. Inspection of it, man, uh, how important does inspecting of the electrodes feel now after looking at that uh, case report, right? So inspecting, making sure there's no cracking, make sure it looks uniform in appearance, making sure the, the wire going into the electrode doesn't feel, uh, doesn't look like it's failing. So our troubleshooting, again, the big thing I want to have us accomplish with your the knowledge we're obtaining and then applying it to your patients is if it's not working, either the patient doesn't feel it enough or we're not getting the motor response enough. Like the, if it's not working, change something. What are we going to change? Well, first up, make sure the machine is plugged in. It's turned on. You have the settings appropriately. Make sure the, the lead wires are the jack is plugged into the simulator. The pins are pushed all the way into the electrodes. But let's look at our patient's skin. Maybe we need to clean it. Maybe the electrode size we can change, the location of the, the electrodes. Those are all things that we can look at. So that's actually what we just did. So it's been roughly how many minutes? About 10, bless you. So it's been about 10 minutes feeling a little tissue. Your tissue feels like it's increasing temperature a little bit. All right, so now what I want you to do is remove your heat, clean your skin, reapply your electrodes, but try to make it on motor points or acupressure points. So the motor points are where? Muscle belly, right? So if you if there's a, a obvious muscle belly in the area that you were treating beforehand, try to get it more in the muscle belly, and then adjust your intensity and tell me if it's really changed. I'm gonna pause this. So hopefully with that little experiment, tens by itself then by changing the tissue temperature, cleaning the skin and changing our electrode location, most of us felt a big difference in sensation. So that's part of the troubleshooting we should be doing. If we wanted to, we could also have changed different size of the electrode pads and seen if that was a big difference in, in one pad size versus the other, especially if we had something drastic like the little dots versus the either two by fours or four by fours. So we can use electrical stimulation for pain management. It's using the gate theory, a non-painful stimulus, try to interrupt the pain signals. We can do it either just to have it on for now and then turn it off, let's go do something. Or with something like TENS, we can take it with us, put it in our pockets, and we can go do either exercise or do any sort of functional activity with it. The two main ones we're going to be using are TENS and interferential current, although we also have pre-mod available to us as well. We'll look at that. Contraindications, cardiac pacemaker, carotid sinus, directly over eye. I don't know what that would. Although, you know, what? we, we kind of like laugh about it, but anybody ever have a headache or a migraine where it feels like it's right behind your eye? Right. So I, I think actually it kind of does make sense. Like, yeah, all right. Probably a good contraindication. Yeah. Yeah. We can do it. Well, I could do it on the posterior side. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Uh, we use the smaller dots for people with TMJ or a whole lot. Uh, epilepsy, we talked about epilepsy and neuro, that section of, uh, I get all the weeks mixed up. So, um, so we, yeah, epilepsy, I think when we played around with the tens, it would make sense how this could trigger a seizure. I, we should say seizure disorders here, right? Not epilepsy. 
Uh, so it could easily trigger a seizure if that's one of our one of the uh, tr triggers we have. Malignancies, unless used for palliative care in hospice. So we can, this is, make sure we understand each other. Cancer is a contraindication for all of our modalities. However, if somebody's at end of life, What's the risks benefit? Like that, that's the reason why they're contraindicated. If you've had history of cancer, we can't do most modalities because there's a risk of if there is some remaining cancerous cells, we could grow them with using these modalities. Although if we're at end of life, are we concerned with that? Not really. It's already done. Like that's we've already gone down that road. So we can, when we're at end of life, we can use some of these modalities again because well, the risks we've already, we've already suffered the risks. Now we can potentially use some of the benefits. So um, loss or decreased sensation, first preg preg uh, semester of, of pregnancy. Patients with cardiac disease should be monitored closely. Uh, directly over an open wound is conjugated for these types of e-stims. And pregnancy again. can be used for pain with informed consent of the patients where there is uh, diagnosed malignancy. That's what we just talked about when it's terminal. Keep your electrical stimulators out of reach of children is another precaution. People like us as kids would just say, hey, first let me lick the battery and then I'm going to start messing with this. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. So again, I think we've talked about the gate pain cycle and the gate theory enough where we don't need to spend a lot of time with it. I think we've experienced enough where you can feel like, okay, yes, this can definitely block pain signals. So our two things that we're going to use it for, there are other ways we can use our tense units that we'll look at. The two main ways that I'm going to ask us to really understand an in-depth way is a sensory level analgesia and endogenous opiate liberation. So the electrode placement ideally would either be on motor point, trigger point, or acupuncture points because those are the areas of the least impedance, the least resistance to electrical flow. So we need less current when we're on the, the, the pads or on those locations. What we're going to look for in the sensory side is tingling sensation that blocks the pain signals. That's all we're trying for. We can place our electrodes around the painful site. That's the most common way that I've seen use it, right? It hurts here. Put the TENS unit there. We could put it anywhere along the corresponding dermatome. And if we think of the physiology of pain and how the pain signals gets transferred from the painful location to the spinal cord. That makes sense. Put it anywhere along that dermatome will be blocking that nerve from sending its painful signals. Will be, it'll just be the sensory signals. It makes complete sense. Um, we could do it over the cutaneous nerve distribution, slightly different than the dermatome, although it's similar. It's the, the thought process behind it is the same. Or along the superficial area to the nerve trunk supplying the painful site. So if we, instead of it going into the dermatomal tract, we could put it at the low back right over that spinal segment that that correlates to. So when we look back at that case study that we saw with the burn, my guess is that they put the electrodes on the painful site distal to the bypass graft. That's, that's what my guess is. That's from reading it. It makes the most sense. When we could have placed those electrodes, we could have placed the TENS anywhere along that path, the, the, either the dermatome level or even put it at the low back. And if we put it at the low back, we're interrupting the pain signal, just like if we were to put it over the painful knee or ankle or calf, whatever it might be. So those for that person, when we're, we're at, we've tried everything. They've, 
they're they're in a ton of pain medicines barely working at all but we know that the the blood supply because he had a bypass graft an artery bypass graft we know the the blood supply is limited so if we do get a wound our risk of healing is our our chances of healing are very low um and we know the sensation. And as we as we have things like neuropathy, sensation becomes impaired distal to proximal. So our sensation at our toes is a lot less than at our calf or at our mid thigh. So knowing that, if we were to apply that type of knowledge for that patient, maybe tens is a great thing for him. But we just need to place it more proximal to the painful site because we have better blood supply, better sensation. So I think we can still use pain for that, uh, still use tense for that person, but we can do a couple of things to reduce our risk in addition to checking the pads. So our parameters we played with a, a lot for our rate is 75 to 150 Hertz or pulses per second, duration less than 200 microseconds. Have you guys played around with really short duration versus somewhere closer to 200? I wonder for some of our people who are sensitive, if that would make that much of a difference because the shorter duration is not as intense. And if we go way back to this graph here, the shorter the duration, the more sensory, the less motor and less painful stimulus. So I wonder if you're if you're comfortable with it, try it again, but jack your duration way down. So compare it versus what it's at its whatever the tens units lowest setting can be versus the cutoff is 200. Compare those two and see if there's a big difference. Amplitude strong enough to produce a tingling sensation without muscle contraction. So that's the big thing, especially as we place our electrodes on motor points. If we're trying to avoid muscle contraction, then we might need a different, even though there's the least amount of impedance in that area, we might need to change pad location because we don't want to create that muscle contraction. So that's, there's always a trade-off for that. Acute pain or chronic pain. What I love about this is patient can wear it as long as they want. They can put it on and walk around. They can have it on the whole day along with them if they want. Especially for somebody with chronic pain, when nothing else is working, hey, if this brings your pain down enough that you can go to your grandkids' soccer games, so you can cook dinner, so you can do whatever it else, like, it's a great tool for us. Endogenous opiate liberation. So uh, getting the stimulation of endogenous opiates can lead to pain relief itself. Our parameters, one to five pulses per second or hertz. Duration greater than 200 microseconds. Amplitude, now we want enough to uh, elicit a twitch. So this one, we definitely want motor points for, for our electrode placement. Treatment time, at least 30 to 45 minutes, not longer than one hour due to muscle fatigue, but making sure our patient understands that this, the decrease in pain, it has a delayed response. It might take 20 to 60 minutes after we do this treatment for it to set in. Better for chronic pain than acute pain. Or in, in times when wearing the sensory analgesia just wouldn't make sense, like going to sleep or um, things like that. There are other settings we could use. Brief intense, good for to block pain during a procedure. It is generally uncomfortable, not effective for chronic pain, but again, it's it's intense. So during that dental procedure, during labor, Hey, honey, don't worry. I got the tens. You did this to me. 
get out of I'll tell you where to put that tent. Um, so those are our different parameters for that. Burst mode. We have uh, one to five bursts per second. And that is one of the settings. If you click uh, clicking on your mode settings, these will pop up in the, I think it's the top of the screen. Top, it, it tells you all the different settings. It's on. This burst mode. Intensity needs to be high enough to create a muscle contraction. Good for chronic pain. Motor response can be uncomfortable. Oh, no, more comfortable. Sorry, more comfortable. Um, so the burst mode, we have 80 pulses per second, but then we have one to five bursts per second within that. So that, that, that's where we got a big cluster of bursts and then down and then a big cluster of bursts again. Treatment time limited for one hour. So... We've played around with both endogenous opiate and sensory. Do me a favor, if you're comfortable with it, play around with the brief, intense, and burst modes parameters and just see if you feel a big change. Did you feel a change on more comfortable on the... Yep. Uh, I believe it should have been, I think there's a normal mode, I think. Normal, yeah. Yeah, it should be. So let's take a little bit of time. We'll play with uh, the other modes here. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about TENS and we'll wrap it up for the day. So the rationale for electrode placements, and we can apply this electrode placement to all of our different electrical currents that we're going to be using. So motor points, typically in the muscle belly, decrease resistance to the flow of current, and that's really what we want, right? So everything we've been talking about, well, a lot of what we've been talking about is how do we reduce that impedance? How do we improve the conductance of the electrical current through cleaning the tissue, warming the tissue, so all of those things, and using a motor point is, is an area of low impedance. Uh, really good if the goal is for a motor response, less so if we only want sensory, but at, you know, if that's where the impedance is high, maybe I have to use this. Um, we could put it on a trigger point, a trigger point is uh, has hypersensitivity to both pressure and electrical stimulation. Palpation of the, these sites cause pain to radiate away. So I, I know a lot of people have said like, well, what is a trigger? What does it feel like? And, and it's one of those things, you know it when you've, you've hit one. The second we palpate a trigger point, the patient will talk about it feels like a firework just exploding. Like we press that point and the pain just kind of goes everywhere. That's that's a you, we can feel the tissue difference underneath of our with our palpation skills. We'll say like, oh yeah, this is an area of increased density, but the patient will describe the radiating pain of it, the spread of pain with it. Uh, this also has. Uh, decreased resistance. So if our patient does have burger po trigger points, we can use that. When we're palpating the tissue, you know, typical density, typical density, trigger point, for us, it feels just denser tissue. Just like if we were to palpate Achilles tendon versus gastrox muscle belly. That density that we feel, we know we're on the tendon because of how the tendon feels underneath of our palpation and how the, the gastroc muscle belly is just different. Acupuncture points is something that I have not historically used with my thought process. Um, I definitely can, especially if I'm lost with the patient. I say, golly, what else can I do? Then uh, looking at an acupuncture map might help me. Um, so their acupuncture points are located all over the body. Uh, Eastern medicine, it's the foundation of Eastern medicine. 
Uh, if we talk to somebody who has more expertise in that area, they'd probably wow us with their knowledge and, and we would be able to, I, I think very mechanically, I have a very mechanical thinking where I say, okay, this has to go to there. This is like, I, I'm very rigid in my thought process. And uh, someone who's less so can really use some of these uh, techniques and use these acupuncture points specifically. If the desired response is sensory analgesia, acupuncture points may afford the greatest availability of sites with, with uh, electrode placement. So here is, the, I just pulled this acupuncture chart. I don't know if locations four, nine, 11, 20, and 26 would get us to quit smoking or not, but hey, you know, you have pain and you want to quit smoking? Uh, Maybe that's what that guy needed in the first. Maybe we should have used that. That guy was a smoker, right? A couple of other things we could do. So we've only been practicing with the one channel. If we wanted to produce a larger area of analgesia, we could use two, both channels and we could have a lot of electrodes. We can control each channel separately. So that's nice. We could crisscross around the painful area, although... There's no benefit to crisscrossing like IFC has. IFC, we have to crisscross around the area. This just produces a big range of sensation all around the area. Uh, so that can be nice. With our patient expectations, obviously education, setting our realistic goals. Hey, listen, this is going to help when it's on. Some people don't like it and we won't use it if you don't want to, but while it's on it, you'll feel pain. It'll feel a little bit better. If we use the endogenous opiate settings, it's going to take a while to set in just under an hour to, to actually perform the treatment. And then it's going to take between 20 and 60 minutes before we start having pain relief effects, but the pain relief effects can last a handful of hours after. So it can be nice for you. So setting realistic goals for it, we're not solving anything, but if we can take away the pain a little bit, Hey, that's pretty good. Uh, prior history with electrical stim can also be a consideration either to use or not to use. Brand was my patient. I wouldn't use electrical stim. Yeah, electrical stim can, for some people, help take away the pain. Brand hates it, so we're not going to use it for her because we're not getting the benefit that we want, right? Uh, narcotic pain medication use and alcohol consumption. Uh, like we talked about with that case, can really limit sensation, and that can be a risk of injury using them at the same time. If we're going to, the great thing I love about TENS, the patient can take it home with them. This is something they can use all the time. They can take it home with them, put it in their pocket. It can, especially for our chronic pain patients where nothing else is helping. It's great for them, but we got to make sure we educate them. And obviously with TENS, it feels so easy. You can go to CVS and buy tens. You don't have to have any sort of license. Like, there's no requirement for it. But look what happened to that guy, even with trained professionals looking after him, uh, what type of damage can happen. So we should be educating our patient. If we're involved in this process, we should be educating our patient about it. What is the purpose? How do we set all the controls, all the different uh, settings that we've got? Some form, form of pain assessment, monitoring, Results, how do we educate our patient on electrode replacement, battery replacement? Uh, who do you talk to when you have questions, do's and don'ts, troubleshooting tips, skin care? There are some forms that we could just have if you use TENS a lot. And, you know, if you've got a chronic pain patient population that you use this with, you might do TENS a lot. What is the education with? And here's our little recap. These are the big things that we want to make sure we take home. Obviously, there's so much of everything we want to make sure we understand, but um, make sure we understand our tens. This is the, the main slide. If you were to say, okay, of everything we learned today, can you put it all on one slide? That's my attempt to do so. Um, obviously, we need a lot more than that. But All right, do we have any questions on tens at all? Yeah. For those of you that are un unfamiliar, uh, in our exercise class, we talked about goldfish. I think that's what she's talking about. That's what you mean by goldy whatever things. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Not sure I completely understand your question. So will the muscle give out eventually? Is that basically what you're asking? Oh. Well. Sometimes uh, sometimes they can get accustomed to to the pulses and then kind of relax with the muscle and then they keep pumping along with you. Kind of like reset the... So it, are you asking if the patient's under like muscle spasm? Is that part of your application question? All right, we'll talk more in a little bit. All right, did you have something else, Annie? No. Oh, all right. I was oh, all right. Um, all right, so... I want to tell you, you know, make sure you bring your pads to class. We're going to be using them frequently. Well, we're going to be using them every single day for the next four-ish weeks. Uh, I, this week, bring your tens. Today and, and Thursday, make sure we bring your tens. After that, we'll probably be, be moving on to our strengthening or tissue repair. I forget which one is next. So you won't need to bring it every single day. But for today and next time, we will. Anytime I say, okay, we're going to practice for practicals, bring it those days because tens will be part of that practice and for your practical, we'll need it too. But just bring it this, this week and then any other time I say, hey, bring those for practice. But definitely bring your pads all the time because we'll need them. All right. Um, I don't want to go into IFC. I don't think we have quite enough time to tackle all of IFC with the remainder of our time. If you wanted to stick around and play with it, you definitely can because we did start with it already. I think we can uh, work your way around those machines if you if you want to get some extra reps in. Um, so I will end class here. I will be here for questions, practice. If you wanted more, any anything from me, stick around. If not, if you have a good rest of the day, use your extra time with uh, something else. So do something good with your life.